Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lynn Josephson. I'm the Senior Marketing Manager for AdGene. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar. We are going to be hosting a live Q&A session immediately following Dr. Miles' presentation, and our panel is very much looking forward to answering your questions. We are going to answer as many as we have time for. And for any questions that we don't get to, our panel has graciously agreed to answer them offline, and we will post those to the comment section under the video on YouTube when we add it. And that is it for housekeeping. So thank you very much. I am now going to turn it over to Jason Nassi, who's our moderator for today's discussion. Welcome everyone. And thank you for attending today's webinar on systemic AAV vectors. Uh, my name is Jason Nassi. I'm a scientist here at Agene. Um, today's webinar is presented through a collaboration between Agene and the Clover Center at Caltech. And it's funded by a generous uh, grant from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tim Miles of the Clover Center. Uh, Dr. Miles completed his undergraduate degree at Haverford College and performed protein engineering work in industry before attending graduate school at Caltech where he completed his PhD focusing on bonding site interactions and stoichiometry of type three serotonin receptors. He then trained as a postdoc in the lab of Dr. Christopher Garcia at Stanford University studying the interactions of cytokines with the human CMV expressed GPCR uh, US 28. Following his postdoctoral training, Dr. Miles served as a visiting instructor at Mount Holyoke College and as a staff scientist at the Beckman Institute before moving to the Clover Center, where he now serves as its scientific director. Dr. Miles is well-funded through grants from the NIH, the NSF, the Gilbert Family Fund, and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. He has numerous publications and has been invited to give several talks on the use of systemic AAVs in neuroscience. It's a true honor to have Dr. Miles with us today. And so without further ado, we will begin Dr. Miles' webinar, Navigating an Expanding Landscape for Engineered Systemic AAVs. Thank you for tuning in to this presentation on an expanding landscape for engineered systemic AAVs. I'm Tim Miles of the Clover Center at Caltech. Today, we'll cover why systemic delivery is so powerful, how systemic AAVs are made, what AAVs are available now and will be available soon, and where you can go to learn more. But first, I want to spend a few moments explaining who I am and what the Clover Center does. Clover is a research center of the Beckman Institute at Caltech that grew out of Professor Viviana Gradinaru's lab there. We focus on viral vector engineering, contributing to technology development, and sharing our knowledge and reagents to make sure these AAV reach their full potential. Our website, clover.caltech.edu, is a general resource for engineered systemic AAV that hosts protocols for capsid directed evolution and production of individual AAV. as well as answers to frequently asked questions about AAV implementation and examples of how our AAV enabled new biological discoveries. If there's anything that you can't find, please feel free to contact us directly. Our goal is that your experiments can proceed as smoothly as possible. With that said, let's step back a bit to go over why AAV are the preferred viral vector. AAV are highly customizable. Inside those terminal ITRs, you have over four kilobases for nearly whatever you like. They have an excellent safety profile compared to other vectors, access dividing and non-dividing cells, and are effective across mammalian species. These factors have made AAV especially attractive for targeting the nervous system, which we'll mostly focus on today. One of the first big choices you have to make with AAV is which capsid serotype to use. This will depend on the type of transgene delivery desired and the route of administration available for your model organism of interest. When it comes to vector administration, there are a lot of options, and the traditional one is direct injection to the site of interest. Direct injection to the brain has several advantages, including low dose requirements, 
low exposure to the immune system, and limited off-target tissue transduction. When paired with Cree transgenic mice, this method can provide exquisite precision of transgene targeting. But it is an invasive and often injurious procedure, which provides only partial coverage with a gradient of transgene expression levels. Very high, right at the site of injection, and then radially tapering off over the course of a few millimeters. This spatially restricted expression becomes increasingly problematic when thinking about the diversity of brains that one might want to one day study or treat with AAV. Consider here the scale of the mouse, rhesus macaque, and human brains in the context of that direct injection on the previous slide. In these larger brains, even the potential upsides of spatial precision with direct injection become complicated. For example, this clinical trial failed in no small part because despite their best efforts, the clinicians could not get their needle exactly where it needed to go. You can see the transgene in black and the circled target brain region. Many of these complications could be sidestepped by systemically delivered AAV though. The brain is highly vascularized and an AAV that could efficiently cross the blood-brain barrier would have unparalleled access to the entire organ. This would be non-invasive and allow for more uniform transgene expression levels as the AAV can equilibrate over the bloodstream. Unfortunately, natural serotypes only weakly traverse the blood-brain barrier and simultaneously infect a broad variety of tissues. This necessitates high doses that can trigger safety concerns. Thankfully, the AAV capsid is also highly customizable and it can be tweaked to significantly alter AAV behavior. This was most powerfully demonstrated by the engineered capsid AAV-PHP-EB, which efficiently crosses the blood-brain barrier in mice to broadly infect neurons and glia. PHP-EB has become a staple tool of modern neuroscience and has inspired a host of new directed evolution AAV capsid engineering methods. Despite our focus on the nervous system, these methods have also been used to target AAV to other tissues, notably skeletal muscle. With the chemically related AAV myo and myo AAV markedly outperforming natural serotypes after systemic delivery. An important caution with engineered capsids that was beautifully illustrated by PHP-EB is that their enhanced properties are not assured in novel genetic contexts. This suggests a need for methods that can identify not just a single winner, but survey the diversity of AAV that can perform the desired task. I want to highlight one such method developed by the Gradinaru lab called Multiplex Create. This method introduces a number of library design modifications that pair with Cree-dependent capsid recovery from tissues and cell types of interest after in vivo selections in Cree transgenic animals. These innovations combine to enable researchers to confidently look beyond the top few AAV capsids and compare each AAV's relative performance across diverse cell types and tissues. To make meaning of these rich data sets, we can cluster AAV by their sequences or their tropism patterns. This has allowed us to expand the roster of engineered systemic AAVs to a broad toolkit for studying nervous systems. There are now AAV for both the central and the peripheral nervous systems, AAV with bias tropism amongst brain cell types, and AAV that translate to non-human primate model organisms. Now I'd like to spend a little time on each one. Bias tropism has many advantages, including increased potency that can lower AAV doses, the potential to avoid the often long cell type specific promoters required with more ubiquitous capsids, 
that can then free cargo space for other uses. And the potential to reduce adverse reactions to AAV from off-target tissues. Biased systemic AAV include AAV PHP V1, which targets brain vasculature with increased potency while still infecting astrocytes, as well as AAV BR1 from the Treppel lab, which targets brain vasculature while still infecting some neurons. PHPN is more targeted, only appreciably infecting brain neurons after systemic injection, but it is slightly less potent than PHP-EV and produces at slightly lower yields. CAPB10 is also targeted to neurons with equal potency and production yield as PHP-EV. CAPB10 also has significantly less transduction across peripheral organs, including the liver, shown here. A new single-cell RNA sequencing platform for AAV characterization developed in the Gratinaru lab showed that in the cortex, CAPB10 broadly transduces molecularly defined neuronal cell types and appears to more potently target glutamatergic neurons than PHPEB. Now we'll return to PHPB and its variable performance across mouse strains. Here we see that PHPB does not outperform AV9 in the brains of BALB-C mice. This is because PHPEB and related AAV, including V1 and N, use the protein Li6A as a receptor for blood-brain barrier crossing. Li6A has two forms in mice, and these AAV can utilize only one of those forms. Thankfully, both the Gratinaru and McGuire labs have identified new AAVs that do not have this limitation. However, PHP-EB still outperforms these AAV in mouse strains like C57 Black 6 and others with functional Li6A, and PHP-EB remains a workhorse for mouse neuroscience. PHP-EB also works across diverse strains of rats, though with slightly reduced potency compared to mice, so higher doses are necessary. CAPB10, which I mentioned earlier, is exciting in part because the neuronal bias and peripheral detargeting observed in mice still holds true in marmoset non-human primates. For broader brain tropism, another variant, CAPB22, is now available. In neonate rhesus macaque, a new AAV called CAPMAC shows increased potency compared to AAV9 after systemic injection, and unlike AAV9, is highly specific to neurons. Though CAPMAC delivers transgene brain-wide, potency is especially high in the cerebellum. We also have enhanced AAV for the peripheral nervous system. The fragile and spatially dispersed nature of the peripheral nervous system makes systemic AAV especially attractive. The first peripheral nervous system AAV, called PHPS, was actually identified somewhat serendipitously and has enhanced potency across the nodos, dorsal root, and enteric ganglia in mice when administered at high doses, like 1E12 viral genomes per animal. More recently, we have used our new multiplexed create method to identify even better AAV. MACPNS1 and MACPNS2 have enhanced potencies even at lower doses, in mice in the dorsal root ganglia and the nodose ganglia. PNS2 alone also has enhanced potency in the enteric nervous system, even in the difficult-to-target distal colon. Excitingly, these enhanced tropisms are also present in rats and marmoset non-human primates. They also go through to neonate rhesus macaques. Interestingly, in macaques, unlike mice, MACPNS1 and MACPNS2 also cross the blood-brain barrier to infect the brain with enhanced potency and a broad cell-type tropism. 
And that takes us back to our systemic AAV toolkit, where we have PHP EB for broad tropism in the CNS. We have a panel of AAVs for biased or specific tropism within cell types of the central nervous system. In mice, in marmosets and rhesus macaque, we now have new capsids, which have either neuron-specific or broad tropism. And in the peripheral nervous system, we have the improved MACPNS1 and 2, where MACPNS2 has a broad tropism across the sensory and enteric nervous system, and whereas MACPNS1 is more targeted to the nodose and dorsal root ganglia. Now, once you have the big three variables of model organism, route of administration, and capsid in place, there's still a lot to decide. Principally, the dose and the time between injection and transgene interrogation. This will depend on many factors, but principally among them can be the level of multiplicity of infection which translates to the level of transgene expression needed for functional readout of that transgene. Now that can vary from relatively low levels that are needed for recombinases to pretty high levels that are needed for optogenetic sensors and effectors, such as GCAMP or D-Lite or uh, opsins for driving neuronal excitation. And so Depending on the cargo that you're trying to decide on, that will inform your decision on what type of promoter you will need in terms of its specificity and its strength, where those two things are often in uh, conflict, or the degree of coverage that's needed across a particular cell type. One other concern that becomes especially important when studying uh, disease models where the cells and the animal itself can often be in a state of distress and susceptibility is the potential toxicity of the AAVs themselves. And especially for these rescue type experiments, it will often have to be empirically determined. Non-human primates come with their own special considerations including the potential for neutralizing antibodies against which you can check ahead of time, the need to really verify that your AAV prep is endotoxin-free to avoid adverse immune effects. One thing that is sort of open at this point is whether it is beneficial or detrimental to have a high full to empty capsid ratio. And so the reporting of the capsid ratio in non-human priming experiments could be very useful going forward to see whether those empty capsids are acting as decoys to sop up immune response, or are there as potential immune stimulants acting against the desired transgene expression. Another important uh, aspect for especially non-human primates is the animal age, where the work we've done thus far has been in neonate macaques, and more work will be needed to see whether those translate through to adult animals. To help navigate these decisions, Clover has created a repository of published experiments with our systemic AAVs that now has hundreds of entries. This resource contains both positive and negative results, along with key variables for successful AAV implementation, including the host genetic background, the promoter, the transgene type, dose, the route of administration, and the time to interrogation. We also included adgene IDs for AAV genomes and links to the paper full text so you can find all those details. It is filterable and searchable and online now at clover.caltech.edu. We hope that this resource will help people navigate the sometimes dense primary literature 
while also establishing some essential parameters that should be reported in every systemic AAV experiment. I'd like to thank our funding sources who make this work possible. Please do reach out if we can ease your adoption of these tools. Hi, right, great. Thanks, Tim. That was a wonderful talk. So let me introduce our panelists first. These are trainees in Dr. Viviana Gradinaro's lab, and they can help answer a lot of our questions. Um, first is David Gertzen, who led the CAT-B10 and CAT-B22 projects. Uh, Zing Hong Chen led the, um, the MAC-PNS1 and MAC-PNS2, and also contributed to the M-Create projects. And then Migi Chupoka, who led the um, CAT-MAC. Uh, so Tim, let me start uh, the questions off and please, if anybody has any questions, please add them to the Q&A section and we'd be happy to answer them for you. Uh, so start off, Tim, what, what advice would you give somebody who's just starting to use systemic AAVs in their experiments and then may have some questions about how to use them? Yeah, so I think um, one of the great services that Agene provides is uh, some trial size viruses of commonly used AAVs. And so there's a number of offerings for uh, viruses like PHP-EB with uh, like a ubiquitous promoter and a fluorescent protein. And so one of the, the first things, if you wanna just get used to retroorbital injections or tail, chain, tail vein injections, if you're not used to that, or you're going into a new uh, post-genetic background where there's not a lot out there on whether the AAV will work or not, or you're interested in a specific uh, cell type and you want to dial in how uh, effective is it at reaching that cell type. Um, I would recommend starting with one of the viruses from AdGene. Um, they are very high quality product. And then um, I would uh, typically, we advise folks to try a, a low dose and a higher dose of the virus. Um, low means around 1 E11 viral genomes per animal. Um, and unlike direct injections, we do kind of think about the total number of viral particles that go into the animal rather than thinking about a volume or a, or a concentration. And then a higher dose can be something like three times 10 to the 11th or even one E12 uh, viral genomes per animal. And then when you, when you have that as a baseline, um, then you can move into some of the more tailored uh, cargo designs for your particular experiment. And certainly if you do that and you find things that aren't matching what you would expect based on the literature, um, reach out to us because um, then we can help you troubleshoot all the little things. Okay, great, thank you. So we've got a couple of questions coming in from the group. Uh, let's start with the first one. Uh, did adenoviruses and AAVs co-evolve for the same sort of utilization of diversity should therefore be possible with adenoviral vectors? Yeah, so I think there, there is a co-evolutionary history between adenoviruses and AAV. Um, I think one of the uh, adenoviruses were uh, the first, one of the first vectors that uh, folks became interested in the, the gene therapy space, um, but really the immune effects of those vectors um, led folks to focus elsewhere. And so I think that, um, has really influenced the, the amount of interest that's gone into then engineering and applying directed evolution sort of methodologies to retrain their tropism. Is the retroorbital or tail vein more reproducible in your hands? Um, some people have had a lack of consistency between the two. I'd say, uh, Hong, do you wanna take that one on? Um, so at least based on our experience and based on like our collaborators' experience, like the retroorbitals and the tail vein injections, the, the, if you die correctly, um, the result will be very similar because they are all like IV injections um, in considerations. 
Um, however, as we do know that like in, in especially in mice like CV7, it's actually more challenging to do the Kelvin injections comparing to the ritual orbital injections. Um, so we usually recommend people doing like ritual orbital injections. Um, but if you feel very comfortable doing like the Kelvin injections, um, we don't think it will create a, a huge difference um, for the two methods. And that's as you get into the the repository on Clover's website, you'll see that uh, it's really almost 50-50 between people doing retroorbital and tailbane for mice. Great. This is a, a great question. I know the one that I've had questions about as well. And I know a lot of people in the field have. Um, do you have any plans to try to optimize cas uh, capsids to target microglia? Which I know is a really difficult one to target. Yeah, so I think um, obviously there's, there's great uh, need for uh, tools that can do that. Um, I think it is uh, been made potentially challenging by folks who've been trying to, to do this uh, in some part because of the, the biological function of, of microglia. Um, and uh, we've, we and others have found that uh, not just microglia, but macrophage in general can be hard to target. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of smart folks working, working on getting there, and uh, there's a lot of potential avenues. So um, nothing at the moment, but we'll, we'll see how that progresses. Great. So here's another one. Um, you said cap AAV cap B10 is better for glutamatergic neurons. How about GABAergic neurons? Has anyone seen that? Yeah, David, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just looking at the um, plot in that uh, review that uh, Tim posted in the, the chat or in the talk rather. Um, so both PHP EB and, and CAP 10 do hit some cabergic neurons, but they're both much more over or uprepresented in glutamatergic neurons. I don't think we have any direct uh, targeting of uh, cabergic neurons, but it's certainly something to target for the future. Yeah, and I think one thing I would add to that is that those experiments were performed with relatively low doses. And one thing we definitely see is that preferences of the capsids become more apparent at lower doses. Um, and so if you do want to hit GABAergic uh, neurons, it may be that you could be uh, with high coverage. You may need something more like three E11 BGs per mouse rather than one E11. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's biases rather than yes or no for, for certain, uh, neuronal cell types there. Uh, this is a great question too. Uh, which serotype of AAV are recommended for the neuromuscular junction? Yeah, Miggy, do you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, so yeah, I think, um, you know, for the most part, right, the, you want to have something that targets the spinal cord. So I think. Um, you know, it, it does depend on uh, exactly what uh, region you're, you're thinking of, but uh, PHP EB or, or some of the CNS variants, uh, you know, especially if we're considering in mice, would be a good uh, capsid stereotype to use. But I do want to emphasize that um, outside of capsid, um, if you're specifically trying to target the neuromuscular junction itself, uh, cargo is also important. And, you know, I think Tim had mentioned this earlier when uh, we be began the Q&A session. But, um, you know, I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, from the engineering perspective and optimization perspective, um, it's definitely important to consider what type of motors you're using, localization sequences, uh, and that type of thing to um, get the type of uh, specificity and targeting that you want of, uh, you know, your cargo that you, you're, you're actually using. So. so a lot of your data was focused on mice. Um, people are wondering, um, what use you have for, or what advice you have for work with rats, specifically um, specific strains like Sprague Dollies versus Long Evans? Yeah, so I, I think um, I might give a, a little preface and then, and then hand off, uh, but I think uh, certainly for any of these capsids, when you're going across species, across genetic diversity within species, there's uh, uh, the potential for things to behave a little bit differently. That's something that has been borne out as we've tested things across more, more hosts. And uh, so I think that's something where the value of the tools that AdGene provides in terms of 
uh, having those uh, fluorescent protein reporter kind of viruses ready to go um, can be really valuable. Um, we and others have tested uh, PHP-EB, for example, across multiple strains of rats. And uh, it's not quite as big a difference from AAV9 as uh, is observed in mice. But uh, systemically, uh, through tail vein, uh, folks have done uh, through uh, ICV or uh, I think intrathecal as well. Um, there, are, there are boosts in, in multiple strains. But certainly, Xun uh, Hong, David, Mickey, if you want to add to that, please do. I think for rats, the dose that's required is just a little bit higher. Um, there was a paper by Dayton and all in gene therapy in 2018 that shows PHP-EB um, displaying uh, comparable tropism to mice. Um, and they compare it to PHP-B. Um, I, I recommend that paper for, for rat experimentation. Yeah, and if uh, you are interested in like the PNS in RAT, and we did also test the MAC PNS1 and MAC PNS2 in RAT, and we also see uh, nice transductions of the PNS there. Um, so if you're interested in using them, you can also use them for RAT. And there's just kind of want to add um, for EB, uh, there, I believe there is some data in our Nature Protocol um, publication. Uh, that does show some rat data of, of EB, and I believe in at least long ovens um, in rats. So um, yeah, I would definitely recommend taking a look there to, to, to take a look at um, you know, how EB works and, and see if it's a good application for um, your use. Okay, another question we have is, is it possible to inject a PHP EB and then subsequently later inject a different version of PHP without having to worry about some immunogenicity and, and getting sequestered with the antibodies? Yeah, repeated injection would be something that would be really helpful for a lot of applications. Um, and so uh, a number of folks have tried to take the insertion loop from PHP EB and put it into different serotypes. Unfortunately, uh, PHP EB came from AAV9. And so other things based on AAV9 are likely to still be cross reactive. And so um, we would not expect that you could repeat administer two different AAV9 based vectors. Um, when folks have tried putting the EB loop into other serotypes, um, AAV1, uh, AAV2, AAV5, I believe have, have been published and they're largely uh, unsuccessful. The, something about the context of the loop uh, in AAV9 helps it have its function. Interestingly, though, when the EB peptide insertion is put into AAV DJ, it uh, actually has an enhanced function, and that's what's been called um, AAV IE for inner ear. Um, and so that's that's something if uh, you're interested in, in studying the cochlea and uh, things like that, that can be a useful tool. So a question about marmosets. Um, I wonder what's the best route for administering AAVs to target neonatal and adult marmoset brain? Any plans to optimize based on existing tools? Yeah, so um, sorry, for the marmoset injections for uh, the CAPI-10 paper, uh, three injection routes were used. Um, so into, oh man, um, <laughs> uh, into the bloodstream in the arm, into the bloodstream in the thigh, and then uh, right beside the eye. Um, there were, I think that this is just something that's going to require more testing, but we saw, um, CAPI-10 working with each injection. Yeah, in general, it seems like, uh, regardless of the access point to the peripheral blood system, um, the virus equilibrates over the body's blood volume and it doesn't have a large effect based on the precise location that it accesses the bloodstream, as long as it's in the periphery. Yes, so this is a great question as well. Um, have you ever noticed any baseline effects on mouse behavior with PHP EB AAVs with empty vectors? Assuming they're referring to some immunogenicity? Mm. So there's definitely, I think it's, it's important to have uh, 
uh, control uh, vectors for uh, just transgene expression. So certainly if you're, um, these have uh, become pretty pretty standard to, to have that. If in terms of just the capsid, um, there are some potential issues of uh, immune response to the capsid um, where uh, it could be that it's processed uh, it's a, a T cell response against the, the capsid itself once it's been internalized. This isn't so much a thing in mice, but as you move to other species, it can be more of a consideration. I think that's one reason why we're excited about uh, the potential to engineer for peripheral detargeting so that you're not just, uh, even if you can achieve specificity uh, against a tissue by using microRNA target sites or having a uh, cell type or organ specific promoter. Um, if you do that at the capsid level, then the whole biomachinery is just not there to interact with any uh, immune response. And so that, that is something that CAPB10 is able to do in mice and in marmosets. Yeah, so kind of continuing along on the marmoset line, um, given the genetic variability affects expression in marmosets, which are more, which are much more variable than mice, is expression of cargo very variable for different animals or is it consistent? For different animals with injections of cap cap 10 cap 22 there was some variability in the um, expression in the brain uh, after systemic injection. I think cap 22 displayed more variability, um, and cap 10 was, was more consistent between the animals. Uh, something to note for this paper was that uh, in injections and, and research was done across four marmoset labs, and so um, despite having a lot of variability in a lot of people's hands, it was still consistent and robust between those um, institutions. And so um, I, I think it's something that requires uh, a little bit more investigation into why that variability is occurring. Um, but uh, yeah, CAP-10 was more consistent than CAP-22 was in the marmoset. Do you want to comment on, on that as well, Mickey or Shinho? Okay, David covered it pretty well. Are there any are there are there systemic or retrograde AAVs suitable for ventricular injection that you would recommend for mice? Yeah, so one of the the interesting things we've seen with uh, even PHP EB is that in strains, mouse strains that have uh, functional Li6A, like C57, uh, WAC6, when it's ICV injection, uh, there can be uh, more transfection and, and broader transfection. So it seems like uh, even from the ventricle, it is having a transport effect. Um, yeah, so I, I think there's uh, there's also been some interesting work done using EB and other viruses through uh, intrathecal injections as well. And so I think there's, uh, while they were designed and optimized for systemic delivery, there's, there's potential for application from other routes of administration as well. So uh, this question is, we are interested in getting strong expression in the brain using PHP-EB at the highest possible MOI. What constrains the amount of AAV that can be injected? We've heard of toxicity at high doses. What is your experience with this and whether it is caused by excessive transient expression or is it intrinsic to the AAV itself? It's a great question. So typically we, we try to stay uh, like maybe like 2E12 BG per mouse as, as around an upper bound. Um, there is some promoter dependence on this strong ubiquitous promoters, we can see some of that toxicity a bit uh, more strongly or more soon. Um, uh, so I think there is an element of just overexpression stress that contributes to this. Um, 
yeah, I think I think that would that would be my my first pass. Are there things that uh, you would want to add to that? Yeah. Um, so just um, you know, I think uh, practically speaking, I, I think definitely working with your um, IACUC and you know your um, ethics committee and, and trying to figure out uh, you know what is the highest dose you could possibly go. And I think uh, from my experience, it's usually informed by um, other literature and, and um, different things that people have tried. Uh, so definitely uh, take a deep dive, but I would say, you know, Tim's um, range of around 2E12 is about, um, you know, the highest that we have gone and or, you know, around the range that we've gone, but we, um, you know, I'm sure there's other collaborations that have, have done a little bit more. Um, but uh, from the perspective of, uh, uh, you know, using the right capsid, I think um, if you do want to use a higher dose, you know, it is worthwhile considering, you know, maybe CAP-B10 or CAP-B22, which um, are supposed to be detargeted from the liver in mice. Um, and that can definitely, um, you know, uh, prevent some of the uh, immune respect, uh, or at least hopefully, you know, we don't have any data on this, but hopefully uh, prevent some of the immune effects of, of using a high dose, right? So um, that, that would be my recommendation is, is considering um, some of the liver detargeted uh, capsids as well as, um, you know, considering um, uh, tissue specific promoters uh, to both prevent the capsid and the transgene uh, immunogenicity, uh, immunogenicity that you might see. <clears throat> I think this, these are some things that we're hoping the, the repository on Clover's uh, website can help people quickly navigate, um, is what kind of doses have people used successfully? Um, thinking back to the question about rat strains, that there are multi data for multiple species, and we do specify the strain uh, in there, so that that should be all findable without going into the details of, of individual papers. Has your group or others looked into the role of post-translational modifications of capsid for viral tropism? I think this is great because there has been shown some differences between like being produced in insect cells and other mammalian cells. Yeah, yeah. So we haven't looked into that directly, but it's certainly an area of study by many folks. Um, and uh, all of our viruses, uh, when we make them and when we engineer them and test them, are produced from uh, mammalian 293, HEK 293 cells. And so uh, the tropisms that we see are when they're produced that way, uh, modified in however those cells are modifying them. Um, so that, that is what we would recommend. Um, certainly uh, could be interesting if folks are making them from insect cells and seeing something different. And that uh, points towards some interesting biology potentially. Uh, so specific to CAT-B10, are there brain region differences in the tropism of CAT-B10 AAVs? Yeah, so in the CAT-B10 paper, the tropism is um, quantified across brain regions in the mouse. Um, so there's moderate transduction in the um, cortex, um, the hippocampus, other strong transduction thalamus, maybe a little bit reduced in striatum and, and across the whole brain, midbrain, it's, it's relatively high. Um, it wasn't directly quantified in the marmoset, um, but in the paper, brain regions from across, uh, or yeah, brain regions across the marmoset brain uh, and coronal slices are uh, displayed. Um, and it seems to be, uh, again, strong in the midbrain, um, really moderate and to strong transduction of the cortex, maybe some lower in some of those other brain regions like striatum. Um, but I would encourage uh, to look at the, the images that are displayed in the paper to see those transductions more directly. Uh, this is another follow-up to kind of the MOI questions. Um, just wondering, how we can control the MOI in vivo. Did you ever check how many virals, viruses are infecting one cell? Yeah, so your, your biggest lever on this is gonna be your dose. Um, and we, uh, I think something that points toward the level of MOI uh, that is uh, possible is the color diversity that we see when we do uh, rainbow style experiments, or uh, we have a, a version of that called uh, vector assisted spectral tracing or VAST. And so, in that, um, you would deliver a cocktail of AAB. So, they'd all be the same, uh, like PHP EB, for example, but they would have a uh, 
one set of viruses, which would each package a, a different fluorescent protein that's then under the control of an inducer virus. Um, and so in order to get uh, the color diversity that we see, you'd have to have multiple copies of multiple different fluorescent proteins and the inducer virus. Um, and so um, we went with PHP EB with around 1E12 total viral genomes across that cocktail. We see a, a pretty wide color variance. And so that's in uh, the 2017 Chan et al. Nature Neuroscience paper, um, as well as uh, several others now have used this, this vast uh, technique for spectral tracing. Great. Um, so getting out to the peripheral nervous system, is it possible to target sensory versus motor peripheral neurons? Junhong, do you want to speak to this? Yeah, so uh, in general, uh, we would recommend um, to use the more CNS um, focused um, capsids for uh, transducing the motor neurons, and then use the more uh, PNS um, focused capsids um, for transducing the, um, the sensory neurons. And like with that combination, basically you can like transduce both or you can just transduce one of them. And I think like in general, like I think like the, the, the last graph that team show like to really show like in which species in which um, like either CNS or PNS like was the vector that you can choose. Uh, basically just like looking at that graph, um, you can choose the, the CNS one for the motor neurons and the PNS one for the um, sensory neurons. So this one, this one comes more from a production standpoint. How do you get rid of the empty capsids in your preps? So there's a number of ways that, that folks have, have gone uh, to think about this. Um, there, uh, if you are a number of uh, column chromatography ways of, of potentially approaching that, um, some folks have, have demonstrated methods where for a given capsid, you can really tune in uh, the buffers that you're, that you're using so that you can separate empty from full. Um, typically, we uh, use uh, iodixinol uh, uh, concentration uh, columns. Um, and we have a Nature Protocols paper uh, Chalice at all 2019 that goes through our production uh, procedure. What we've generally found is that right at the boundary between the 40 and the 60% iodix and all is where it is more biased toward full capsids. And then the closer you get toward the protein layer, the more likely you are picking up empty capsids. And so when we're producing virus, we tend to. Uh, if you want, when we grab uh, for as high, uh, much virus recovery as we can get, um, I think we usually see around 40 to 50% to uh, full uh, capsids when we then look under a negative stain on, on EM. Um, if you do, you'll sacrifice yield, but if you just grab right from the 4060 uh, interface, you can bias that. Uh, toward much more full capsids. Does transducing astrocytes activate them with these systemic AAVs? Shin Hong, do you yeah. want to ask that one? Yeah, so uh, in general, uh, I, I think that's like, always like a big concern. Like if you transduce uh, certain um, cell types, like would it uh, kind of affect the nature and behaviors of the cell types? And I think we haven't specifically looking at like the exercise um, activations ourselves, um, but based on our collaborators, um, because like they, um, they uh, in, when they do experimental exercise, they also usually compare them to uh, non-injected um, animals. And so far, we haven't uh, heard uh, many uh, comments about like the exercise activations specifically. Um, so at this point, uh, we don't think it's like a big issue, but we do recommend you if you want to use your systemic uh, vectors for specific cell types, um, do uh, con compare them with the non-injected mice um, to make sure that the, the vectors doesn't affect the, the cell types nature behaviors. And we have looked a little bit into 
Um, so I mentioned in the presentation a single cell RNA sequencing pipeline. And we looked at use that in terms of the tropism, but also trying to look a little bit about expression change in response to infection by an AAV. And so generally things seemed uh, pretty mild uh, is, is the take home. Um, but you can look at that uh, paper is uh, brown at all in uh, frontiers in immunology. All right, we've got time for just a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, this is a question I also had before we got started, so I'm going to ask it. Uh, does the lack of leaky blood-brain barrier influence the expression of PHBEB? Uh, for example, like circumventricular organs in the CNS, uh, air stremia, hypothalamus. Yeah, so it's been relatively, it's a, it's a logical thing to expect. Um, what's been interesting, I think, is that as we've uh, walked down doses um, so that the blood-brain barrier crossing gets, uh, might uh, predominate less, um, and you start seeing those preferences in place come out more, really where it holds on the most is around the striatum. Um, and uh, not so much some of those areas where you might expect based on uh, vasculature fenestration or things like that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't think that has borne out, uh, but we also haven't been uh, actively searching for that. Uh, yeah, are there things folks would like to add to that panel? I think we should take one more question here. Um, is it possible to conduct a workshop in the future to get people hands-on experience on learning how to make the virus um, all the way to injection in mice, rats, and check expression? Yeah, thank you for, for bringing that up. This is something uh, we've been hoping to do uh, when the world uh, gets to a space where we can, can invite folks out. Um, we did have uh, as part of the NSF Neuronex uh, uh, hub, uh, we collaborated with the University of Michigan in a uh, uh, hosting workshops on systemic AAVs. Um, and we hope uh, as uh, things get to uh, a safer space to, to be hosting folks at Clover and doing just that. Um, for uh, individual uh, investigators, um, we also can uh, uh, feel free to, to reach out and we can be in conversation about um, advising via, via Zoom or uh, potentially having uh, an individual trainee or two come out. So uh, please look to, to our website as and we'll, uh, we'll pop, uh, advertise that as we uh, open up those workshops in the future. All right, great. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. Just want to thank everybody again for coming. Um, if we didn't get to your question, again, we apologize for the lack of time, but we will answer those and we will post them in our YouTube channel um, in the, the comment section. So we will get to answering those for you. So thanks again, everybody. Thanks for the panelists and uh, Tim for coming here. It was a great, a great session. Thank you so much. Thank you.